you finished everything or do you have doubt in that tell me sir i have a doubt tell me question number sir uh, 30th like it is more of a conceptual doubt okay. just let me read the question first okay. question number 30 A parallel beam of light or the events in the space is in the middle of the light. Okay, question number three. So hundred <laughs> nanometer. What is the energy? Twelve point four EV. Twelve point four EV. So like the doubt is like uh, they have given a parallel beam of light. So like twelve point four EV is the difference that one photon can make at a time. Correct, so, correct, correct, uh, correct. First photon strikes. I calculated it <clears throat> up to if it is in ground state initially. It See, every every atom will interact with one photon at a time. So no need to worry about a large number of beam because beam will interact <coughs> one is to one. Okay. So, so like <coughs> one beam can interact with uh, one. only one, only one atom. Yeah, in one beam you can say one. So one beam is one photon. Okay. One beam, no, one beam, one photon interacts with one electron. <coughs> okay, okay, okay. Ah, so the doubt was over. So now you can solve it for them. Sir, also I had a doubt like, uh, if uh, the entire energy of the photon is absorbed, what mm. so the existence of that of that photon? If it is absorbed, then the electron will go in the excited state as per the energy value. And what happens to that photon? The photon is gone because the photon is energy only, na? No? Okay. The photon is energy and momentum. And I have explained in the last lecture that ah, the momentum okay. part is so small that the energy required for momentum conversion is negligible compared to the energy required for the transition part. Yes. <laughs> so that is what we proved in the last lecture, isn't it? Ah, yes, sir. yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So anyone who has finished this book completely? No. No, sir. I've done till thirty. Okay. So by next lecture, you, you will, will you be able to finish. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now for questions of photoelectric effect. Photoelectric effect, you, you, I hope you know. I have studied in chemistry. Yeah. Yes. Sir. If you need some help, you can let me know. Then I'll teach that also. But I think that is like uh, then uh, you're learning it for second time. Yeah. yeah. So. <clears throat> so let's uh, we are done with the Bose theory. I think nothing is left in the board. We have done all types of collision and all, right? Yes. So I'll talk about something called X-ray now. Sir, actually, I said in the last lecture something about that Rutherford formula. Ah, yeah, right, right. right. Just tell me, tell me what I said. Uh, sir, just a second. Rutherford is scattering. Scattering. Correct, right? Rutherford. Yeah, very good. I forgot to tell you. Sir, one more experiment to your topic. Davison, 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 Jeremy. Yeah. Ha, that... No, now, now you remember everything. Don't worry. So, <coughs> so this has to do with the chapter called uh, rotational mechanics also. And this derivation itself is a nice way to understand uh, some other concept of mechanics as well. So in this experiment, we are going to consider just single nuclei. Okay. So let's say we have a nucleus which is rigidly fixed because that uh, the gold foil was rigidly fixed, isn't it? So <clears throat> if we have a nuclei, 
with positive charge and it is rigidly fixed <laughs> imagine this is uh, some atom with atomic number z so the charge we are going to consider is z into e this is the charge of this nuclear i hope this is clear <laughs> okay. yes sir now the interaction of uh, nuclear with the other charged particle is short range interaction what does it mean so the nuclear force is a short range force <clears throat> so if you are even let's say few nanometer away maybe 100 nanometer away you might not experience anything but the moment you enter the like nanometer range <clears throat> the interaction begins so the idea is because of the very short range interaction, the most part of the journey will be straight line except the near the nuclear part. So what exactly we do is we throw a positive alpha particle, let's say, from certain distance and this distance in mechanics we call aiming parameter. This aiming parameter is also used in case of gravitation and also used in case of uh, like modern physics or electrostatics we use in these chapters. Alpha particle is also a positively charged particle. And the charge here will be I think you remember the charge of alpha particle, it's 2E, right? Uh, yes. Sir. And using some particle accelerator, like we have the cyclotron, oh, we don't use cyclotron, yeah, but you can use. So let's say we have some particle accelerator in which we accelerate these particles and then we release it. So we release with certain velocity, let's call velocity as V0. And this is released parallel to this line, parallel to this line. So what will happen? <clears throat> As I said, most part of the journey will be straight. Almost, just when you are very close to this. And this B is not even in millimeter, but the B is in <coughs> nanometer range. That's a whole idea. So as a result of a repulsion. So the moment you start coming closer to this, the repulsion will act like this, isn't it? And <clears throat> the repulsion will change your path or the trajectory. Eventually, let's say this is the path in which you move parallel to. So the journey will be again a straight line. And the path between these two points will be the path where the interaction is significant. So in many ways, this derivation is important. It is not just derivation, but rather a, a complete new mathematics, which you will also learn that how to manipulate or derive things how to use the momentum, impulse momentum theorem, and so on. <laughs> so we assume that this is the final path of the alpha particle. So what is the deviation angle? What is the angle of deviation? So we call this as angle of deviation. Can we say? Yes. So this is the angle of deviation, which we also call the angle of scattering in this case. Basically, it's a deviation angle, but we call angle of <laughs> Is scattered. So we say that the alpha particle has is scattered by angle theta. This is how we say. It. These all diagrams are highly exaggerated. Okay, so don't think that this is the diagram, which is actually no. This is a diagram of my convenience. So far, so good. I think you can understand this. Now, when you are very far from the nuclei, what is your momentum? 
MV. MV not. And when you are very far from the nuclei on the other side, what is your momentum again? MV. It is again MV not. Do you realize this? Because of symmetry, the reduce in the kinetic energy because you are coming closer. So potential will grow because of the two charge particles. We know the formula of potential K Q Q by R. So as you come closer, potential will increase. So kinetic will decrease. Yes or no? <laughs> Yes, sir. But when you yes. go back to infinity, potential is back to zero. So all of your energy will be again kinetic energy. Do you realize this? Yes or no? Yes, sir. So at a minimum separation, what happens? This is very interesting. Uh, this is something which will also come across in another chapter. So at a minimum separation, what happens? The velocity vector and the distance will be mutually perpendicular. So maybe I need to. Let me draw this. Okay. So at the minimum, okay, this is not a right place to draw. So the minimum separation is separation at which <coughs> the velocity vector and the distance, the radial vector, these are mutually perpendicular, and this is called the minimum separation. So minimum separation is the point of, uh, or you can say line of symmetry also. Okay. So if you extend this line, it will divide the angle into two parts. So this angle <coughs> and this angle will be equal. equal. How much will be this angle? I think this is pretty easy to determine. Phi two. minus theta by. <coughs> okay, if I call the, the direction as the direction of resultant vector, if this is the direction, so initial momentum we know, final momentum we know, so resultant will be in this direction. So this is called the direction of change of momentum, the delta p direction. How from vector you can easily understand this is initial vector. This is final vector. <laughs> this is theta. How to find the change in momentum? Final minus initial. So minus initial means vector form is reverse. Yes. This is minus of initial, isn't it? In vector, when you put a minus and you revert or a, like you reverse the direction. And then <clears throat> Difference means you're finding the resultant of these two vectors, which is angle bisector, isn't it? Yes. So the change in momentum is this only. No? Do you realize this? Maybe. Yes. 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 So if you draw at one point, you can find the. So the finding the <coughs> magnitude of change in momentum is pretty easy. How much is delta? P? You can derive from here. What is delta P? Take the component of this and this along this line. MV naught cos of pi minus theta by 2. Yes. Yes. We can sign theta by 2. Very good. So, Anyway, from mechanics, we know how to find the change in momentum. I hope this is clear. Yes. Sir. Yes. Sir. And and the force acting on this charge particle will vary the direction because as the force will be here, then it will be here, then it will be here, then it will be here. Okay. Eventually, it will become zero at infinity. So once we know the momentum delta p, we can use the impulse part. What is the impulse definition was? <laughs> Summation FID. It is FDT, right? FDT. Force into time is called impulse. So those who don't know impulse must remember force, product of force and time is called the time is the duration of action or impact, we call impulse. <laughs>
So when it is supporting, you give impulse. When it is opposing it, you take away impulse. That's simple. Now, we know the direction of a resultant vector. So what we do for the sake of derivation, we choose some random point. And let's say alpha particle is here at this particular instant when we are considering. And then the force acting on the alpha particle will be this way, isn't it? This yes. is the force. So this is the force acting on alpha particle at this instant. And let's call the separation as R. Let's call the separation as R. So how to write the force from Coulomb's law? A Z E is 2K. A Z E 2E by R square. Isn't it? Yes. So force yes. we can write as uh, K 2K Z E square by where it is. Now we are going to use this formula at some point. So this is the question number one actually, I would say. Delta P is the question two. <coughs> okay. And this angle is something which is variable. So I'll take this uh, delta P as a reference and I can call this angle as phi. Okay. Now, F will have two components. One is F cos phi, which is changing the momentum. And F sin phi is not changing the momentum. Do you realize this? Yes, sir. Only the component in the resultant direction is contributing, isn't it? <laughs> so let me tell you the definition of impulse. Those who have not heard about the impulse, let me tell you what is impulse. Impulse, you can add a J vector. Uh, some book will also use I vector. And impulse is defined as simple product of force and time. It's so simple. Product of force and time. And we know that the J here acting <laughs> is basically F cos phi into time. Can we write like this? Okay. But this is impossible to integrate. Why? Because there are so many variables. So how many variables do you see here? Phi. Phi and R. Phi, R and T. E. There are three variables. So first time in the history, you are trying to solve a question of three variables. Is it possible? Not yet. No, it's not possible. But there is a technique. So now comes the third part. This let's call the equation. Now comes the third concept. So let me tell you that this concept is prevalent everywhere. When something is fixed, like Earth and satellites or any planet, so this is a fixed charge. This is the moving charge. <laughs> Even though the force will be acting on the capital Q, will it move? Yes or no? No. No. It means there is some hidden force who is balancing it yes or no yes so this if i call the system of capital q and small q as a system then can we say that there is some hidden external force yes sir and because there is a hidden external force which you don't see so can we conserve the momentum yes sir no how you can conserve momentum Achha, there is a hidden force. Sorry, we can. So, whenever we have the external force into picture, we cannot conserve the momentum. Is this clear? Yes, yes, sir. yes, sir. yes sir. So, we cannot conserve the momentum. One thing is clear. The second part is <clears throat> if you try to think of force, every force will pass through the capital Q. Yes or no? Yes. Because the repulsion between these two charge particles will pass from Q only, right? And even some hidden or contact force is acting there only. Yes. Isn't it? So every force will pass through capital Q? Yes or no? Ah, yes. Hmm. So what will be the torque about Q? Zero. And when torque, net torque ah, about angular point angular is zero, angular. what we conserve? Angular momentum. We conserve angular momentum and therefore 
if I call the velocity at this instant as V, because we don't know what is the value. So the third concept is called conservation of angular momentum. Conservation of angular momentum. And what is that? So you need to understand how to write the kind of angular momentum. We write orbital here because there is no spin. So we write the orbital. What is the initial angular momentum of the alpha particle about, about <coughs> the nuclei? M V not B. Very <coughs> so conservation angular momentum about O. O is the nuclei part. So initially it is M V not B. <coughs> At the instant you are trying to move. M V R. No, we don't know the angle. Achha, huh. It is not 90, it is some angle, which we don't so know. So we take R minimum, maybe. No, why we can take R minimum? We have to write here, no? at that instant. Okay. So we write as M omega square, sorry, M R square omega. It is like moment of inertia of a particle about O into omega, I omega. And omega is the angular velocity of the particle with respect to O. Now this is the difficult part. So angular momentum, we also have the formula L equals to I omega. Yes. So for a particle, what is I? MR square. MR square. And then omega. So this will not ask you for the angle. That's the beauty of this, that if you don't know the angle, express in this way. Now this is also learning for you for the point of view of mechanics. Then when to write what? If you know the angle, it's good to write that way. But if you don't know, write in terms of omega. I hope this is clear to all of you. Yes. I know it's difficult. So now <clears throat> the fourth equation is something really interesting, which will let you realize something. So if you simplify what you can see that V not V turns out to be R square omega. But what is even more interesting that R square omega, we can write as D phi by D. That is the omega definition. The rate at which you change from reference. As you will move, phi will increase, right? At the very next moment, you will move by D phi. Isn't it? Yes, sir. So the angular velocity of a particle always refers to the rate of change of angle with some reference line. That is the definition which uh, I have taught in the circular motion chapter. If you have seen, you remember, if you don't know, just understand what I'm saying right now. So what is angle of velocity of a particle? It is the rate of change of angle made by the particle with some reference line. Once again, what is the angle of velocity of particle? It is the rate of change of the rotation of the line. Okay. <laughs> line of you can say position vector of the particle with respect to some origin so how that line is shifting its orientation that we call omega so if let me tell you again if we have a particle moving this way and if there is a o point so refer the uh, omega of the particle about o is simply defined by join the line okay and take some reference line let's say this is a reference line and then check as you walk, as you move, how this angle is changing. So omega of a particle is defined as a d theta by d. That's a definition. So if we have studied the circular motion, we must be knowing this. Is this clear as of now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So even if you don't know, try to remember what I'm saying. The definitions are very important. What is the angular velocity of a particle? It is the rate at which <clears throat> the position vector changes the orientation with some reference, of course. So V not B, we can write as R square D phi by DT, and that is the beauty. Now I can add DT is what? So DT is R square D phi upon V not B. And now you realize, in fact, the dt by r square, the two variable has converted into now 
see dt was missing and now in fact now i can substitute dt by r square which was impossible earlier to integrate now this is integrable do you realize this do you realize this yes or no yes sir so this was impossible to integrate now this is possible to integrate i hope this is clear to all of you hopefully I mean, i'm not sure so 2k z e square upon v not b <coughs> and what we are left with is something really simple cos phi d phi oh my god and the phi will change from where to where If you have really understood this, it means we have understood the most difficult question of rotational dynamics. This is the impulse momentum theorem. Now we are able to derive this relation because of the great inverse square law. If I make the inverse square law by some inverse cube law, we won't be able to derive it, isn't it? Because we, we will never be able to. Replace R square. It will yes, be R sir. Okay. So the nature is you now somewhere like a interleaved. It is entangled. Everything is connected. Nature having some internal mechanism of connecting each other, which we also you know they reveal through the mathematics. That's the beauty. Somewhere there is some thing is working mysteriously. So now we got the J. Can you integrate this? Hopefully. Yes, sir. Yeah. So if you integrate, what will get tell me? After integration, what are getting? 2 cos theta by. Very good. 2 cos theta, theta by. Theta by two. So 2 to the 4, this will come. 4, four k z d is equal. So by v not b into cos theta by two. This is equal to two and v not sign. Correct. Now comes the impulse momentum theorem, and the very heavy appearing sentence impulse momentum theorem is nothing but the consequence of Newton's second law. This looks heavy duty, the right? impulse momentum theorem, something like beyond this universe. Right? So we know from Newton's second law, F equals to? DP by DP by DP. So DP is how much? F DP. F DP. So this definition is impulse and this definition is? Oh my, change mm -hmm. So impulse is always equals to? Change in momentum. So those again who don't know this, it's very simple. This is the ball. This is bad. Uh, bad again. Good. Yes, yes. Very famous. So ball will come with some momentum. The bat will hit. Hit means you apply impulse actually. And then ball will deflect in other direction. That's called the final momentum. So <coughs> impulse, you can think this way. I vector is P final minus P initial. So <coughs> the other way of thinking is the initial momentum and the impact. You can think impulse has some impact. So initial momentum plus impact is The easy version, this is football. And this FIFA is bringing so many surprises. Now yes. in Belgium, there is a riot going on. Yes, Morocco defeated Belgium, no? Yeah. Yes, sir. Good. And now you know there is a riot going on. So let's say this is the football. Moving with velocity v not, you make a you give a kick like this. This is kick. So kick is like impulse. 
So how to find the final motion of the football? Football will go something like this. Do you realize this? Yes, sir. Because this is the initial momentum. You give the kick like this. And this is the final. Triangle law. Or vector. This is triangle law, right? Okay, anyway. Anyway, so I, I can go to the directly the derivation. <coughs> so now, how much is the impulse we got? 4kz square was theta by 2 by v naught. 4z square by v naught b um, cos theta by 2 right yes sir huh. yeah fine equals to 2m v naught sin theta by 2 so what is uh, this is v naught just a moment So what we are getting here? <clears throat> Got theta by two equals to or let me find solve for the b actually. So what is the b? B equals to z d square. Got theta by two. Got theta by two. 2 pi 2 pi m not m not v0 square zero. v0 square right yes so this is the relationship that <laughs> the aiming parameter and the angle of scattering so if you give different b you will get different scattering angle that's why uh, if you remember that in the alpha scattering experiment, many alpha particles deviate by more than 90 degrees, not many, uh, one in 10,000. And only one retraces the path, that is one in 20,000. So out of 20,000 alpha particles, one will go back to the same path. Like the deviation is 180 degrees. And many will go less than 90 also on the other side. So this is the relationship between the aiming parameter versus angle of scattering. So this is the relation of aiming parameter. Aiming. There is another formula called the <laughs> so, n theta. Yeah. Ah, sir, I was going to ask that. Like, how was that derived then? That is much beyond. I mean, that is having some other theory also. So they bring the theory of cross section and all, sigma and all. Okay. Because it is related to numbers of. Yeah. Particles. So how many alpha particle will scatter at angle theta? So no need to remember the derivation. Just remember that this is inversely proportional to fourth power of sin theta and yeah so this is what you need to remember because one question was asked in some examination i don't know which one maybe which plan your vi to something <laughs> let me give the exact formula so the n theta is it in sc verb given no SUMI open. SUMI has not discussed this. Issue, I'll tell you the exact formula of this.
So there's a there are many formula. There's a formula for the fraction. Uh, there's formula for the cross section. So the cross section we write as this is easy. We write a sigma, which is we take aiming parameter as a radius. Okay. There is a fraction formula, like how many <laughs> will deviate by a given angle. So fraction is given by some complex formula, or you can say proportional to cot is square theta. Okay. This is easy to remember by because this is cot theta, this is b square. So this is proportional to the cross section actually. So this is the formula. And the last formula is this one. This is theta by two. So this is called Rutherford. This is actually called Rutherford scattering formula. So those who are interested, I'll just share the derivation. You can watch it or read it for your own curiosity. Okay, so there is a derivation of course you are uh, having the influence of looking through, you can go through. So what you just need to remember is that n theta will have the relation uh, inverse of fourth power of sine of half angle because that is what they, what they asked actually in the examination. <laughs> okay, nobody else. What was the next? I think this is, we are done with the formula. What is next? So De Bruyne is something, but I guess I've done. Yeah, yeah. De Bruyne. Let's come to that quickly. So let's call the the wave particle duality. So Einstein was the person to say that light is a particle because that assumption was uh, leading to the explanation of a uh, photoelectric effect <laughs> and light is a wave also so einstein said okay light can behave as a wave as well as particle so he said in the context of photon but de Broglie to prove the fact that a particle indeed behave as a wave okay <laughs> the thing is why we don't experience in our day-to-day -day life we need to realize this why we don't experience the wave character. So tell me something lightest object which you have uh, seen or experienced. The lightest object. Right, tell me some lightest object, the very light object which you have seen. Dust particle. Dust particle, yeah, you can say dust particle. So what do you think? What is the mass of that dust particle? Microgram? Yeah, probably. Microgram. microgram is observable, yeah. slightly difficult. Milligram. Microgram is, let's say microgram. <coughs> so microgram. So one of okay, mass equals to microgram. Let's keep it one microgram. Which is how much? Okay. <laughs> uh, tell me the velocity. Which you see generally, few centimeter per second, even it is yes, slow. Yeah. <laughs> Let's say two centimeter per second. That's too much. Assume it. 
और लिस्ट करो वन से भी टू पॉसिबल लेट स्केप एवरीथिंग वन 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 सो वन सेंटीमीटर पर सेकंड हाउ मच इज दैट माइनस टू मीटर पर सेकंड व्हाट इज द व्हाट इज द मोमेंट टाइम रेस्ट माइनस इलेवन ओह माय गॉड दैट्स वेरी स्मॉल हैं सो व्हाट इज द कोरोस्पोंडिंग डी ब्रो वेवलेंस H by P. P. Oh my God. How much? <laughs> What is the visible light? The range is roughly. रफली मैन सिक्स Let's say it is eight thousand something. So point eight into thousand into uh, minus seven. How much? This much. Ah, oh, minus seven. Imagine that your ability to see the visible light, like human can interact with the visible light, having wavelength this much. What is the? What kind of energy will have this wavelength? Minus twenty three. It is beyond cosmic radiation. The most powerful radiation is cosmic, with the least wavelength. But this is exceeding everything in the universe. That is why in our real life, it is almost impossible to observe the wave-like behavior of regular objects which we interact with. But the moment you go to the subatomic world, try to understand this. The moment you enter the subatomic world, what will happen? in that world we talk about electrons what is the mass can we say this is minus 30 kg roughly is it okay yeah just for calculation and not only that the velocity is 10 to 6 let's we if we talk about the bohr's atom and all can we say roughly this Okay, what is momentum, guys? What is wavelength? The de Broglie wavelength. Hmm. You can see it's coming in angstrom. The order is coming in angstrom. Yes or no? Yes. Do you realize this? The moment you enter the subatomic world, the de Broglie wavelength, or you can say de Broglie wavelength, it comes into the range of observation that humanly we can detect or observe, and that is why the electron diffraction or electron interference is a very famous phenomena. It's a very commonly observed phenomena. So electron behave or exhibit the interference and diffraction because the wave character is very much observable limit it is within the limit of observation but the real part is that we talk about in with the day to day life in which we live and imagine your mass and your velocity the wavelength will be even smaller isn't it yeah. see i took the very light part the, to divide h h by p and as small the p will be uh, i'll get more and more lambda so even the lightest particle is having so much wavelength imagine our wavelength can we really observe such wavelength 10 to minus 30 can we the answer is no by no means we can observe minus 30 minus 32 minus 33 uh, angstrom or sorry meter wavelength so that is why <clears throat> the wave particle duality exists everywhere but it is only observed in the subatomic world <laughs> So the formula of de Broglie wavelength, which we 
uh, derived from the Einstein theory. So we derive the fact that uh, the momentum is energy upon C. And from there we got uh, this is H by lambda. <laughs> so the reverse process is that the lambda is H by P. And this wavelength is true for the photon and for the particle as well. So when we talk about the particle, it becomes D Brophy wavelength or D wavelength. And how to write this? So momentum you can write as M into V. For any particle, the kinetic energy is a common factor in which we express the answer. So kinetic energy and the momentum having a relation P square by 2M. <laughs> so momentum of a particle, we can also conveniently write like this, 2MK. Isn't it? Yes. Yes. So the D Broglie wavelength of a particle is uh, many times we write like 2MK. And why we generally talk about the electron? Because electron mass is such a small, it's a, such a small particle that its wave character is quite dominant, or you can say significant, or it is within the limit of observation. That is the reality. Okay. Why we talk about so much about electron, not about other particles and not about others, uh, D Broglie wavelength, because those are seemingly difficult to observe. As we move towards the heavier particle, their wave character will be beyond the limit of observation and therefore we in fact don't talk about it. and the davison german was the basically proof the proof to establish the fact that <coughs> particle does behave as wave and how he proved so we'll come to that so anyway <coughs> the d broglie wavelength we write h by 2 mk the common mistake that many students make energy of a photon we write as SC by lambda. Do you remember? Yeah. Or H nu. This is the Planck's law. Yes. The mistake that you can write, energy of a particle is not equals to SC by D. This is incorrect. This we cannot write. This is only for photon. So energy of a particle, when I say, if someone is asking you find the energy of a particle, <coughs> whose D Broglie wavelength is known to you. When they ask you the energy, it means they are talking about the kinetic energy. And how to get the kinetic energy of a particle? If you know the D Broglie wavelength of that particle, using this relation, what is the relation? Lambda D equals to H by 2 MP. So 2mk is how much? H square by lambda. So the kinetic energy is how much? I think this is what we discussed in the last lecture. Okay, anyway. Yes, sir. So remember yes. that, okay, when and what not to use. This is not, I mean, this is incorrect relation. So when you write the energy of photon HC by lambda, don't use the same thing for the particle. Particle will have kinetic energy. And that's why the formula should be used this other way around. Okay. So given the D Broglie wavelength, they may ask you to find the kinetic energy. You have to use this simple relation. I hope this is clear to all of you. Yes, sir. Yes. So do remember this. Next. We have to write the photon, I mean, uh, the D Broglie wavelength of uh, other cases also, like uh, for a gaseous molecule. We know that kinetic energy of gaseous molecule <laughs> is proportional to temperature, isn't it? Yes. So for, for monoatomic gas, how you write kinetic energy equals to? 3 by 2 kt for every atom. Can we write like this? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> so if you can add kinetic energy as 3 by 2 kt, what will be the D Broglie wavelength? <laughs> H by 2 mass of the gas particle into 
and this will become how much? Sometimes <laughs> you need to express the answer in terms of uh, most probable velocity. So considering the most uh, probable velocity, what will be the d probably wavelength? They can ask you anything. They can ask tell you, okay, considering the RMS, what is the d probably wavelength? So the answer will change by 3 mkt, 2 mkt, or something like that. Understood? Yes, sir. So the yes. idea is given the kinetic energy, we can find the d probably wavelength of gaseous atoms as well. Gaseous atoms. We're talking about individual atoms. Okay. The third way of writing will be <clears throat> so many times we accelerate charged particle through some potential difference. So let's say we have a particle accelerator or we have simply parallel pet capacitor. <clears throat> so let's say this is a, a charged particle Q and the potential differences. So when you release this positive charge particle, it will accelerate from high potential to low potential, yes or no? Tell me. So this will accelerate. And at the this point, <laughs> there's a, there is a hole, you can come out of this. So when the particle will come out of this, it will have some kinetic energy, yes or no? <coughs> so what will be the kinetic energy of this particle coming from here? UV. So what will be the D broadly wavelength of this particle? H by under root 2M UV. For electron, if you do the same thing for electron, the D will be how much? 2M EV. Correct? Yes. And this turns out to be, this is a calculation which you should remember. This is 12.27 by root of V angstrom. Now this is something you have to mug up. Remember. Is this clear? Yes, sir. So to find the D broccoli wavelength, uh, we use this relation. This is very important relation because in most of the uh, electron diffraction or interference, we can use this from directly to get the wavelength. And uh, later on, when you will study the wave optics, uh, imagine if I have having the double set experiment using the electron. If you perform the YDAC with electron, <coughs> because of wave, wave like characteristic, it will also show you the maxima minima. The difference is the word maxima and minima will have a different interpretation. So, the maximum is the electron will accumulate in large numbers. On a screen, so it's like a, if I have a photographic plate, you know something about scintillation, right? What do you call it? scintillation or scintillation or whatever. So when a charged particle will strike the photographic plate, it will produce some lightning, right? So on a screen, after passing through the two slate, the electron will create a pattern with, uh, you can see there is a large number in one place, then there is a very less number, and then again large. So instead of uniform distribution of electron, what we see is, a biased distribution of electron. So we have somewhere more, somewhere less. So the high concentration <coughs> region, which we encounter with the something called the counter. So we have counter as a device also. 
So this is called maxima, this is called minima, maxima, minima, and so on. It can continue like this. This is called the YDSE by uh, electron. And the gap between the center of the two bright region, we call fringe width. So beta is called fringe width. Now, the formula for the fringe width <coughs> is lambda d by d. I mean, what is d by d? Don't worry. But at least remember that the fringe width is proportional to wavelength. That's it. Remember this fact. In the wave optics, we'll come to this in detail. So now the question is, the beta will be proportional to, can we write this as inversely proportional to 1 by root v? Where V is the voltage? Yes or no? Yes, sir. So V means if you increase the V, the energy will increase. More the energy, lesser the de Broglie wavelength, isn't it? So if the electron interference is obtained, and if I increase the kinetic energy of electron by some means, then what will be the effect on the fringe width? The answer is, as you increase the potential, or the, called the accelerating potential, the fringe width will decrease. This is a very common question that will come across. Okay. So this relation is important because now from here we are going to move. We can move to the next part called the Tavisan and German experiment, which was the uh, <clears throat> indirect proof that particles do have the wave like character. So what was that experiment? Let's see, try to explore that experiment. But before the de Broglie wave, I mean, so before this uh, Davison German, I would like to introduce you a concept from wave optics called diffraction. <laughs> and uh, the proof I'll give you again later on. So as if now you remember that this is called the Bragg's law. So Bragg's law is basically <clears throat> Uh, also called the X-ray diffraction. But uh, you can also do it with the help of electron also. So what we'll try to understand what is Bragg's law. So in case of a metallic lattice, in case of metal lattice, You know metal lattice, have you heard this name, metal lattice in solid yes. state? Yes, sir. So in metal lattice, what happens? We have a very arranged geometrical pattern of atoms. So atoms are, you know, arranged in some finite geometrical pattern. That's called lattice. And if there is no finite geometrical pattern, what we call? Amorphous. Amorphous shapelessness but when there is a different shape we call crystalline so try to understand this So the, the world of interaction depends on scope, you know, scope. So in physics, there are three scope in physics. You must have heard about this. So what are the three scope in physics? 
माइक्रोस्कोप मैक्रोस्कोप द लास्ट इज मेसोस्कोप so this is the way in which you can understand the physics uh, the entire interaction is size based okay something which can interact will uh, will have some size relation okay so we have interaction of microscopic particle because they belong to one scope of the particle macro will have different scope meso is something in between <coughs> okay so x ray is very small okay and crystalline objects you can say the metal in metal the atoms are so closely packed that a visible light cannot penetrate visible light cannot penetrate remember this okay so why this bragg's law is so famous because x ray is such a small that was one of the biggest application of x ray that with the help of x ray we were able to determine the internal geometry of any crystalline object especially the metals okay when we talk about the metals they are having the crystalline shape and x ray deflection was the biggest breakthrough in terms of the study of the the internal state and also to understand the defect within the metal because that is not visible to the human eye we cannot see those uh, defects but based on the x ray pattern we can understand that okay, uh, uh, is this, there is some defect in the surface or not in fact uh, for the fine grade polishing of a metal surface if we it is going to be used for some high end research the surface is exposed to the x ray and they obtain the pattern and through the pattern they understand whether the surface is uh, evenly polished or not something like this okay. so there is application interference having some deep application okay that you will also come across in currency uh, you can say printing uh, they use the idea of diffraction and interference to create the color chrome okay so the from different angle you see different uh, uh, monogram or hologram thing kind of thing all those things are possible because of the interference and diffraction phenomena and those diffraction uh, happens with the visible light now the thing is <laughs> for very small size i mean closely packed uh, atoms we need even a smaller wavelength and x wave x wave was a small wavelength which was making it feasible to interact at discrete level so when i say feasible it means the size is comparable with the dimension of the lattice spacing so there is something called lattice spacing so to prevent the frequency what we do we the <laughs> we study about the you know color of butterfly or some more vibrant uh, creature in nature and we try to understand how they produce that pattern so more the complexity it is more difficult to reproduce the currency and that is why in currency of high value uh we use a lot of diffraction grating by carving the paper into different shape so there is a molecular variation of the carving of paper which you don't realize it is not a plane paper isn't it i mean there are some so many zigzags so we have something called lattice spacing lattice <laughs> and how the diffraction occurs <laughs> so let's say the x ray is coming and hitting this atom and going back to this part so this is like a reflection by the first atom <laughs> and then we imagine that uh, let's say some wave is uh, able to penetrate the next layer of the lattice and it will be you know getting reflected somehow like this from the second layer and what we do next is we take some kind of convex lens and uh, we convert this light ray <laughs> on a screen and because these waves are coming from the two closely you know located source so depending on the 
path difference, it may produce either maxima or minima. So this is called the angle, and uh, this is called the lattice, especially as D. So the light wave traveling from this direction and reaching the screen have traveled different length. So there is something called path difference. And uh, this path difference you can easily calculate by dropping a perpendicular from here. <laughs> so if you zoom out and uh, draw it separately, you can draw it separately for you. This is the D and uh, We draw something like this. So do you realize the meaning of path difference? Let, let's see, up to here you travel same distance, right? Let's say O, A, B, change like this. O, A, B, C. So you can see up to O, A, both wave have traveled same distance, right? <coughs> and beyond O, C, you can again see both have traveled same distance. So which wave has traveled more distance? The bottom one? Yes. So, question is how much extra it has traveled? How much? Given this angle is theta. So, this is theta. So, this will be 90 minus theta. This is 90. This is theta. So, <laughs> if you look carefully, the path reference is how much? 2D sin theta. Do you realize this? Yes, sir. Yes. <clears throat> now, the x-ray is very small, as I said, but if this 2D sin theta is equivalent of N lambda, which is called the condition for maxima, or uh, you can say for uh, constructive interference, or for brightest, brightness, uh, yeah, brightness and brightest uh, point. So the delta x is called path reference. So for constructive interference, or constructive because that is what we obtain on a screen. The path difference must be containing integral multiple of wavelengths. So the number of wavelengths, because these are very small wavelengths, I mean it's be difficult to imagine them. So <clears throat> the wavelength is everywhere, but this is the additional wavelength or extra wavelength. And if the count of the wavelength, if you count the wavelength, if it is integer in number, you get a maximum. <laughs> so delta x is n lambda. And therefore, you can add 2d sin theta equals to n lambda. <laughs> and uh, for the nearest expression to find the nearest gap you can put n equals to one <laughs> so the, for d minimum what you can say d minimum is how much lambda by two sine theta understood yes so what we do is we keep on uh changing the angle of incidence on the crystal and we try to wait for the maxima condition so let's say for one some angle theta <laughs> the screen is showing you a very bright spot, which means a constructive interference has occurred. And uh, so how you move is you move from that, like, you know, the light ray is somewhere here. And then you take this light ray at some angle, you slowly like this, till you get the maximum here. And the moment you get the maximum, you stop. And that is how you find the lattice dimension. So the D minimum is called the lattice separation. And this is how exactly it is determined. Okay. A surface with a defect will show you a different diffraction or interference pattern. Okay. 
so the brax law for x ray diffraction is a very famous law and uh, uh, the benefit of this was to investigate the surface property in the crystalline spacing and so many uh, other things also okay. now the same thing the diffraction here we are performing using the electromagnetic wave called x ray which we'll study very soon the same thing was performed by the whom davison and germa but there's a difference here we are performing with what x ray and now we are going to perform with what Light. electrons electrons okay. because we are we are trying to prove the wave characteristic of particle so now comes the davison and germa <laughs> so this was like some sort of you know background which you need to understand to appreciate the davison germer experiment so this is a very simple experiment so what we do in this experiment is what we do we take a nickel crystal what we take nickel crystal what is the color of nickel anyone knows it is white silvery no? nickel so yes color wise it is silver only so nickel is mixed in high quantity to make gold as white gold okay so a gold which is more white in nature will have more nickel into it similarly we use cadmium also for a different yellowish and we add something different for rose gold color and so on anyway so right now you do not see the the crystalline structure of the nickel crystal this is a big crystal which you are having <coughs> and i just this one screen to shift the okay fine okay. let me make it a better diagram okay. So, first of all, I need to make something called electron gun. So, imagine this is the simplest diagram of electron gun. So, what electron gun will have? It will have a coil, some metallic plate, and some potential to accelerate. so once the electron is released it will accelerate and will come through this hole so we make sure that the hole is very small so that we have electron coming like this so now <clears throat> this electron will bombard the nickel crystal and not only this once the electron is coming out of this electron gun we further accelerate this so because it's electron so we have to put it minus here so <coughs> the experiment was performed under certain potential difference because we know that as we change the potential difference the corresponding de broglie wavelength will change yes or no yes sir so this was performed under the 54 volt accelerating potential so the electron arriving near the crystal will have de broglie wavelength how much root 150 by 54 can you tell me how much is this tell me someone Is 
Tell me how much. Sir, close to root three. Okay. Yeah. Ah, close to root three. Uh, I don't know. Close less than root three. Anyway. One point six something. One point six seven. Very famous answer. So now we are playing with uh, an electron whose corresponding d Broglie wavelength is 1.67 angstrom. I hope this is clear. Yes. Sir. Very good. So what do we do next? Once we have this, we have a this you know this is a circular track which I have drawn. <laughs> So this track is basically let me make it some more fancy diagram. Let me change the color. So this is <clears throat> a path for the counter. So we what is because electron is a particle. So we need some counter to count the number of electrons received. Okay. So here we don't see it, rather, we receive the <coughs> Or we count the electron coming to a certain point. Okay. All right. So if you obtain the, if you put the counter, the counter can slide across this tube, you can imagine. So this is like a polar coordinate system. I'll just draw some polar coordinate system. So you can see the angle and all. It looks fascinating. If you do a, a, it's like a chart paper with <coughs> the angular and polar coordinate system. Something like this. Okay. And every line is uh, representing some angle. So now the light ray is coming, I'm uh, sorry, electron is coming, which is equivalent of the X ray. Okay. Right now we have no idea about the plane. Okay. We have no idea about the plane. Okay. So it was found that uh, the electron is making maxima in one particular direction. And other direction it is making the you, know, you can see the counting is lesser in other points and it is maximum to one particular point. So if there is no interference, if there is no diffraction, <laughs> the scattering should have been uniform because if it is really particle, then uh, from the statistical point of view, every direction is equiprobable event, isn't it? And if every direction is equiprobable event, so we must encounter the electron in every direction almost equal, yes or no? But what we really found? We found that the electron is <laughs> having maximum or maxima in the one particular direction. You can see this is the counter here. So we found that the counter at 50 degree having the maximum counting of uh, electron. Understood? Let me do this better. Counter, I'll do like this. This is better. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 This is the counter. So you can move the counter <coughs> left and right. And as you move the counter, then uh, you can see there is a different counting value which you are uh, getting. The counter gave the maximum value at one particular angle, and that angle was 50 degrees. And the graph which you plot, if you plot the graph of uh, the intensity of uh, electron versus the angle, 
the graph was something like this. So I'll just change this. Like a leaf like a structure. That's too much. If you can peak at 50 degree axis, will be degree. This is the graph actually. <coughs> so the blue line is representing the graph. And this graph will uh, tell you that uh, the obtain and the, the intensity of electron obtained by the uh, this counter is not same, it is very and it is at one particular angle, it is maximum. <coughs> Now, this kind of behavior is typical, the behavior of wave actually, because wave interfere to change the, or create the new energy distribution or change the distribution so that we obtain different intensity at different point of state. So this is the idea of uh, Davison German experiment. Now I'll try to tell you why it is 50 degree. Okay. So as a matter of fact, the lattice dimension of Nickel crystal is known to us, and in fact, let me tell you the lattice of the nickel crystal is at some something like this. Let me go back somewhere. Else. So this is 50 degree, and uh, what I'll do is I'll like extend this line, which is the angle bisected one, uh, 50 degree. This looks better, and then you can draw the line which is perpendicular to this 50 degree. So as for the law of reflection, <laughs> this is the nickel crystal <laughs> and uh, it is coming at some angle and going at this angle. This and this angle are equal. Okay. Now, the lattice dimension of uh, the nickel crystal is known to us in advance. So what is that dimension? Let me tell you. So the nickel lattice is facing <coughs> B is 2.15 angstrom. How much? 2.15 angstrom. So to understand the Bragg's law in this particular case as well, how we do is let me go to the next page. So imagine the two points which are very close to each other. And let's say this is the lattice spacing. Imagine the two wave is coming because electron is like a wave. So we'll assume let's say two wave is coming from the top in the or pinnacle direction. And after reflection, <laughs> the wave is traveling at some angle. Which angle? Theta. So can you tell me what is the path reference? Uh, how to calculate the path reference? We can draw perpendicular from that, right? We have to draw a perpendicular from here to here. Yes. And we can find out the angle. Yeah. So this is the, so given the D, this is the extra distance, which is the first wave will travel. That theta, D cos theta. D cos theta, D sin theta. I don't know. It is always D sin theta. D sin theta. Mm -hmm. So similar to the previous experiment, we have a lens and these two waves will <laughs> reaching the lens will converge on a screen. We typically keep the screen at focal point or focal length of the lens so that they converge at or on the screen. That's a simple thumb rule. <clears throat> so this gap is always F. Okay. Anyway, so now the wave coming after reflection will travel like this. Can you tell me what is the path reference? 
Dell tax is how much? 2D, no, it's not 2D here. It's only D sin theta. Okay. So what is the condition for maxima? For maxima, what we can say? It will D be D. sin theta equals to N lambda. Mm -hmm. uh, for the first order, we can put N equals to 1. Because we are talking about the nearest space. So D sin theta is lambda. <laughs> so what is sin theta? No, no, no. Now the D Broglie wavelength, the D Broglie wavelength we know already. How much is that? 1.6. And the nickel crystal lattice is pressing is how much? 1.6. So the theta will be sine inverse of anyone with calci can tell me the answer of theta. This is for you. I know the answer, but anyway. 50.96. So it is roughly 50 degree. Yes. Now coming back to this experiment, mm -hmm. the law of diffraction or uh, <coughs> interference is also justifying this experimental setup, isn't it? At 50 degree, we are getting the maximum intensity because at 50 degree, the interference is constructive. Do you realize this? Yes. Sir. <coughs> So this is the 50 degree and uh, from here onwards, you can also get this angle. So if it is 50 degrees so this angle, which is remaining on both sides, if I call alpha, this is also alpha. Can you tell me what is alpha here? So how much is alpha? So from here, we also determine the fact that the lattice crystals are having alpha degree angle with such to the horizontal and which I have drawn here. And the D which I have taken is on the surface. I have taken two atoms on the surface actually to demonstrate this experiment. So I have taken the two atoms here. So using the interference relation and the experimental setup, if you see, it is completely verifiable. And therefore it is an indirect proof that yes, particles do have the wave-like character and uh, it is difficult to observe in day-to-day -day life. But when it comes to the high energetic electrons, they do exhibit such character with ease. Understood? <laughs> so davison germer experiment is Diffraction with electron. That is the crux which you must remember. Okay. I hope this is clear to all of you. Uh, one more thing, the last thing. <coughs> I think it's not part of J, but it may be asked in some generation. Okay, what they will ask you in this question in Davison Germa, because it's a part of syllabus. What you must remember, you must remember that the maxima for 54 volt, the maxima is 50 degree. As we change the volt, what will happen? The D Broglie wavelength will change. Yes or no? Yes, sir. <coughs> so decrease the angle of maxima will also change. Understood. So if I increase the voltage. <clears throat> lambda will decrease and as lambda will decrease you can see the formula here uh, where I wrote the formula yeah. here you can see as <coughs> as the lambda will decrease theta will decrease because d is fixed yes. isn't it yes sir so with increase of voltage theta will decrease so I can say theta as the voltage will grow theta will 
डिक्रीज सो मैक्सिमा विल शिफ्ट इज इंट सो मैक्सिमा विल शिफ्ट टूवर्ड्स द वर्टिकल लाइन जस्ट रिमेम्बर सर यस is there only one point of maximum over 350 degree uh, on in both each direction so in the right it is one then left will be also one okay 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 so because we have crystal so we will talk about only up upward right upward yeah so for this uh, experimental proof uh, deviation and germa got the novel prize see By simple solving trigonometric equation, you can get the whole price. So now you must understand how important is trigonometry. Eh? I mean, so what is left? <coughs> the last is called Compton's effect. Is scattering of <coughs> photon due to collision. Hmm. So imagine we have a photon. Of energy H nu. wavelength number <laughs> momentum h well number when it comes to the interaction of photon with electron it is always one is to one relation one photon can interact with only one electron at a time that's as per the classical thing or as per the quantum theory so many photon electron interaction is not feasible how but it is commonly observed phenomena that right? the interaction is always one to one okay so we have electron at rest <coughs> photon is coming and after this collision photon and electron goes in two different paths so let's say the electron is going this way to collision let's call this as phi or you can call theta also and the photon <coughs> gets scattered along a new direction so it will have a new energy e dash it will have a new wavelength lambda dash it will have new momentum h by lambda dash <laughs> in any question what we conserve in any collision we conserve the momentum momentum so from conservation of linear momentum if i choose this as x axis we can say the initial momentum was along x <coughs> so along the x direction the initial momentum was h by lambda and electron having zero momentum because it was at rest and <clears throat> after collision electron will have momentum let's move on this is my so the x component of the momentum of the electron is p cos theta and then we will have momentum for the scattered photon we can call the person so what about from the conservation of energy so from energy we can add the energy of photon was hc by lambda but now the energy <laughs> uh in this case 
means SC by lambda dash plus. And in the world of relativity, the energy we write as mc square. So we can write as uh, mc square, where m will be the relativistic mass. So what is m representing here? Mass of electron at rest and whatever velocity you acquire. So this m is this, this is the rest mass. So I'm not writing a rest mass, I'm writing the <laughs> relativistic mass. And we are not supposed to solve anything. So just we can leave this. So in the world of relativity, we don't write kinetic energy. As you remember, the kinetic energy and the energy of mass remains together. Okay, I think we can also write here. Oh, my bad. So we can write m not c square plus sc by lambda. The rest mass, sc by lambda is sc by lambda m, the relativistic mass mc square. <laughs> So why you need to write this equation? Because they may ask you equation itself in the worst case scenario, or maybe they will give you some comprehension in which they will tell you, okay, write the equation or which of the following equations correct way of writing the energy equation. So you need to know that in the world of uh, relativity, we never write kinetic energy for particle. When it comes to particle, we write the just MC square, which takes care of everything, the energy of the mass and energy to the motion as well. So having written all these things, if you solve, this is what you need to remember. <laughs> so the wavelength has shifted, you can see. Lambda to lambda dash. Which one is bigger? Lambda dash. Because Lambda energy is taken by some other part also. So yeah. the lesser energy means bigger wavelength? Yes. So as a result of collision, <coughs> the wavelength has increased, isn't it? Imagine if I take that particular wavelength to open my YDSC, I can clearly see the fringe pattern will change. I will have bigger fringe pattern, bigger fringe width. The fringe width will become bigger. Why? The lambda is increasing in the due process, isn't it? Yes, sir. So again, this could be a hypothetical question in the J advance. Like, <laughs> let's say in the uh, a photon collides with a photon at rest. I mean, with the a scattered photon, we obtain the YDSC. Then what will be the effect on the fringe width? A very simple question, but if you do not understand, it may appear some Greek and Latin for you. So it is not very difficult. You can understand that uh, every collision will reduce the energy. And uh, because of the reduction in the energy, <laughs> What will happen? The wavelength will increase. increase. And as the wavelength will increase, the beta will increase because, I mean, of course, I mean, many don't know about beta. So this was the beta. I wrote some of This is called beta, the fringe width. <laughs> so fringe width is proportional to lambda, <laughs> isn't it? So as lambda will increase, beta will also increase. I hope this is clear to all of you. Yes or no? Is this clear? Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah. So this shift in wavelength is called Compton shift. Compton shift. And this is the Compton effect is the proof of what? Particle behavior of uh, light or particle uh, wave behavior. Of light. In Davison Germa, <laughs> we talk about the wave character of particle. In Compton effect, what we call talk about particle behavior of a wave because photon we generally consider as a wave. But now what we are seeing is the particle behavior because without particle behavior, the energy cannot be exchanged. Understood? If you remember the collision of a photon with an atom, I told you that in the collision, either it is completely absorbed or reflected back. Do you remember this, this fact I talked about in both here? Yes. Okay. So there, what we are considering that <coughs> all of the energy will be taken by the uh, atom for the excitation 
and if it is not feasible, it will just throw it back. So that is also a particle behavior. <clears throat> Whenever we talk about the quantized state, we talk about the particle behavior. So here the collision is also talking about the, uh, the particle behavior. Or am I wrong? Am I saying opposite? Just let me confirm. Not any. So what you need to remember that this Compton shift, the change in wavelength, <laughs> after the derivation, what you will get is, and one more question, one more question. This is the conservation momentum in the X direction. This is X, what is Y component? I hope you understand because in the Y there was no momentum. <laughs> so net momentum in the Y must be zero, isn't it? So now the Compton shift, uh, the delta lambda is given by H by MEC one minus cos. So depending on the angle of scattering, the shift we can write. What is the maximum shift possible? What is delta uh, lambda maximum? H by MEC. It's a nice sorry. Um, two H by MEC. Correct. So when phi is <laughs> 180 degree, so when you reflect back, then the wavelength <clears throat> shift will be maximum. So at phi plus two pi, the shift is two H by MEC. So what you may be asked is just this formula okay. and the relation. So the maximum shift possible is this much. Okay. I hope this is clear to all of you. Yes. Next. So now we can go to the X-ray. <laughs> so X-ray is called the Inverse photoelectric effect. What is inverse photoelectric effect? Okay, what is photoelectric effect? Tell me. Photon uh, is incident on a metal and an electron is released. Ejected. Sorry. Very good. So it is the ejection of electron by the incident photon, right? Yeah. So what is incident here? Electron. No. What is incident? Incident. In photo okay. effect, photo electric. Photon. Uh, photon. Photon. And what comes out? Electron. electron. So if I reverse the process, what we are going to do now? Electron we are going to incident. bombard the plate with electrons. And what we expect? Photon. Some high energy photon. Okay. So first of all, we need to know that what is the range of X-ray? Okay. What dimension of wavelength we talk about in X-ray? Okay. So X-ray begins with uh, <coughs> from 0 0.1 angstrom up to 100 angstrom. Okay. So the range of X-ray is how much?
जीरो पॉइंट वन एंगस्ट्रॉम अप टू but this way i confirm this the range part because many factual question also comes oh it's a 0.01 mm -hmm. so even is smaller so this is the range of the x ray mm -hmm. <coughs> now is smaller the wavelength more the energy isn't it Yes. So, <clears throat> if we talk about the lambda of X-ray, so it goes from zero point zero one <laughs> up to. So, the larger wavelength X-ray, we call softer X-rays, and the small. <coughs> Wavelength X-ray is called or oh, I think simply hard X-ray. Hard X-ray, soft X-ray. So hard hard X-rays are very energetic particles. They are having very high energy because the energy you can write as SC by lambda. And uh, this is uh, 12 for Double zero, double zero, EV. Oh my God! One, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> so what you realize that X-ray energy will range in mega electron volt. Okay. For softer, what we can write? One point two four. That's too small. No, no, this is how much? 12.4. So it goes to at least KV. So <clears throat> the range is from the, of course, uh, mega electron volt from kilo electron volt up to mega electron volt. So generally, <coughs> the typical range is from KV up to MEV and this range is also important to be remembered by us. We must remember the range of X. Why? So you will you need to you know identify which of the following is X. -ray. So if the answer is in uh, electron volt, you can outrightly reject because we never consider the X in the kilo electron, uh, electron volt. It must be in the kilo electron volt, then we call X. -ray. Also, if it is value is much more in mega electron volt, let's say if it is uh, 100 mega electron volt, 1000 mega electron volt, in that case, we talk about the gamma rays because gamma ray is 100 times more powerful than X ray. Okay. So the range is important to identify which of the following, if they give you energy value, and if they ask you whether the, the gamma ray will have this range. So if gamma ray is given in kilo, kilo electron volt, you can reject because gamma will have the energy in mega electron volt and beyond. Okay. And that is also why the reason, okay, reason that uh, in most of the nuclear transformation reaction, what we see is the gamma ray because that is the energy level, which is a very typical energy level in nuclear transformation. Okay. So there the energy is always in mega electron volt and not just mega it is in uh, thousands of mega electron volts at least few hundreds of mega electron volt okay so this range is also very important thing and the one must remember as i said x-ray is the reverse phenomena so <coughs> here we have the specific first of all we need to uh, realize that can we produce x-ray with the lighter atoms or elements yes or no So let's talk about the hydrogen. What is the maximum energy we can have in hydrogen atom? So maximum we can have is 13.6 electron volt, isn't it? Yeah. So one thing is sure that uh, for lighter elements, it is impossible to have excel. Okay. So we know that uh, H atom will have the Lyman, Balmer, and so on series. So Lyman 
uh, stops at ultraviolet. So definitely it is not excellent. So we need to increase the energy at least thousand times more than the electron volt to go into the kilo electron volt. <coughs> and we know that the energy from less what? 13.6 Z square by N square. Let's keep it 13.6 Z square roughly for maximum value, isn't it? Yes. Yes, sir. So we're just trying to understand the common sense. This is something common sense that uh, to obtain the answer in this is EV to make it thousand times more than this answer. I need to make this roughly how much? Can we say roughly 30? Uh, yes. This 30 square is how much? Nine. 900. So now we are nearing the, the range of kiloton volt. Do you realize this fact? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. The idea is <clears throat> to go into that range of energy we cannot take any lighter elements. We have to go to elements which is at least more than 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, and beyond that, because we need to make it 1,000 times, so roughly 13.6 into a number which is 1,000 is definitely more than 10 at least. So the whole idea of X-ray is to produce the X-ray, we have to go to the heavier element. So the general element which we use uh, to perform the experiment of X-ray is cobalt, molybdenum, iron, and so on. Okay. So what we use? So general metal used for X-ray experiment, we to go to the like molybdenum, cobalt, iron, and so on. So we use heavier element, okay. Because only in case of heavier element, the transition <coughs> energy can fall in the range of desirable energy value, which we call X-ray. So X-ray is a part of electromagnetic spectrum having certain range of energy. So this is how we classify the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. And this is how we rate it. Okay, so this is X-ray. Uh, this is gamma ray, this is ultraviolet, this is I mean, uh, visible, then infrared comes below. <laughs> and then the list is, what is the list value? Radio waves. You know, the wavelength of radio waves goes in kilometers. <coughs> That's why in RFID, what we use? Radio waves. What is RFID? What is? Oh, wait. Radio frequency interface devices. The famous example is fast tag. So the fast tag machine which you see, they scan is the RFID. And it works at a very large distance. So because it is the wavelength is in kilometer, you can detect from anywhere at any angle. So <clears throat> these are like zero power devices. So we do not need energy to operate. That's why the sticker with no energy is sufficient to be detected. The interaction is almost with zero energy. So in the <coughs> electromagnetic spectrum, We need to know the energy reference. So the bottom most is called so as you go up, frequency will increase, as you go down, wavelength will increase. So the radio waves will have the highest wavelength in the kilometer range, which is good because bigger the wavelength, easier the diffraction. Okay. Okay, don't take this radio wave means uh, these uh, radio channel wave, not the, the same. <coughs> the highest is what? On the topmost? Cosmic ray. Cosmic energy. So cosmic energy is basically the protons. Yeah, these are mostly 
uh, fast moving protons, uh, which is like a, it's like a blown by the supernova. stars, supernova, every breaking star, they release large chunk of energy, which are carried off photon and uh, protons. Because nucleus will have, it's like you, you break the nucleus and throw it out. So what we get is protons and neutrons. But mostly protons and neutrons become proton because of the high energy interaction. So cosmic contains maximum uh, proton and this is very powerful energy. And sometimes it is very dangerous because it can directly create the transmutation process. So you may become Hulk, but possible. Okay. So it's not an impossible thing because these are so much uh, powerful energy that they can bring or carry about the nuclear transformation at will. So thanks to the Van Allen belt, you know, I have I've talked about this somewhere. So the earth magnetic field. <laughs> which is <coughs> thousand of kilometers away from Earth's surface. That electromagnetic field is so powerful that it traps most of the electron. So we know that formula in the magnetism that force equals to P into V cross B. So Earth magnetic field is powerful enough to capture most of the charged particles which are coming from the outer space. And that is how we are prevented. Otherwise, no life can exist on Earth. Because we all will undergo transmutation process. So our skin will burn and will get destroyed in no time. So the life will be gone. So no vegetation will exist. Thanks to the Earth's powerful magnetic field, which is preventing this. So that's called the Van Allen belt. You can read about it if you're interested. I think don't know, Allen is double L, whatever. So <clears throat> below the cosmic, which energy comes? Gamma. So gamma rays are basically due to the nuclear transformation. So when, uh, okay, we'll talk about this in, of course, chapter of nuclear, but this is the, uh, through nuclear transformation energy. Okay, we'll talk about what is that. So there's something called excitation and de-excitation of nucleus. You have heard about the atom, but there's also called excitation and de-excitation of nucleus. <laughs> and when a nucleus de-excites, it will also release the energy, which we call gamma energy. And below the gamma, so the range is what? This range is in, this will be in the GEVs, giga. Then comes the XL. The KVs. The general order is KV. And then? Visible. The ultraviolet, visible. See, the difference is not much. And then radio, so microwave, radio wave. So this, these are the energy relation. <laughs> okay. And the frequency relation. So you must remember this range. So below that comes in EV. <laughs> and if you come below, then it will be fraction of EV. <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> it will be a very small fraction of EV. Then it will be milli EV, micro EV, the radio waves, you can imagine how much is the radio waves. It's really, really small. So do remember this energy relation, frequency relation, and all relation. So it will be helpful to answer some of the questions. Anyway, coming back to the X-ray. X-ray is an inverse photoelectric effect. So we have to perform some experiment and then get this idea what is happening. <laughs> Sir. Yeah. But like the what is the principle behind creating X-rays like this by bombarding electrons and assuming this and like photon? So ion. we are going to study what we are going to study. X-ray only. So wait for it. I haven't finished X-ray yet. But so like, why were they bombarding metals with electrons like this? Oh, that's what I'm saying. Wait for it. No? We'll okay, continue okay. everything. <laughs> so now the experiment name is called the Coolidge experiment. Obviously, it's called Coolidge tube experiment. 
So what is Coolidge tube experiment? <laughs> So again, we have some vacuum chamber <laughs> as usual. Well. And in this vacuum chamber, what do we have? Next is see, we need some electron, right? So how to produce electron? Take a cathode plate, some metal plate, put a heater. And the heating will, <clears throat> it's like a coil, you have put some coil, heating will happen and heating will create something called thermal electrons. <clears throat> so thermally excited electron, we call thermal electron or thermions, we also call thermions. And the thermally excited electron, <clears throat> follows an equation called the RD equation by the two scientists, one from the mostly American, other from the German. The name is Richardson, this man, I can say Dushman, maybe they are Dushman, maybe those, I don't know. So Richardson Dusman equation. So what is this equation? It says that <coughs> on any metal plate at a temperature T, the thermal current, which we represent by I, is given by the formula A is T square E power. Now again, I let me tell you, this question based on this formula will not come in JE mostly, but if you're writing the bits plani or maybe some VIT dimension or exam from the South India. <laughs> so they will ask question from this uh, formula also. Maybe in CET it can come, quite possible. So this is called thermionic current. The A is called RD constant. This is the surface area. Yeah, I know it's confusing. Sometimes you think A is like an area, but S is the surface area, A is the RD constant, T is the absolute temperature. Phi is your famous, what is phi? <laughs> what is phi? Work function. <laughs> and K is the, <coughs> what is K here? Tell me guys, what is K here? Boltzmann constant. Boltzmann constant, very nice. So K is the Boltzmann constant. Okay, so anyway, this is not required to be known in this chapter, but still knowing this will help you in some other junction. I don't know which function. Now, once these electrons are emitted, we have to accelerate these electrons through a very high potential difference, generally in the kilovolt to mega volt range. Why? Because the energy positive by the electron 
to fall in the X-ray energy range, we know the answer must be kilo electron volt or no, no. mega electron no. volt. So what we must do? We must accelerate by that potential from at least thousand to more than thousand, like up to tens of thousand of volt. So generally, the potential that we apply, which I will show you in a while, will range from thousand volt up to. Now this is simple idea. We need energy in certain range that then only we can call X-ray. Otherwise, we can't call X-ray. <coughs> X-ray is not something X-ray. It's just a we have given name to certain energy level or range. Then we have something called something like this. I don't know what it is. You know what it is? So inside this, there is a this is called a holder. This is going to hold something. I'll tell you what it will hold. So the metal specimen is put in this bracket. So green part is like a holder in which you, you know, keep on inserting a metal sample of your choice. <laughs> so what you put here, a metal sample of your choice, <laughs> nickel, molybdenum, tungsten, or whatever. The remaining part which you see will have some cooling system. So we have some coolant and cooling pipes. Because in the due process, a lot of heat is produced. So we have compression, just like a refrigerator, you can think of like a refrigerator. And uh, this will have the coolant, which keeps the temperature. Otherwise, it will fuse, it will just vaporize. So imagine the amount of energy released in the process is so high that in many cases, it has vaporized the metal target itself. So this uh, block is called the metal target. Let me change the color. So generally, we keep on replacing the target <laughs> with something. Uh, the cooling system is there. And then, as I said, connect this sample with a high potential difference. <laughs> and now, I mean, of course, I mean, don't worry about the other part. Uh, we make sure that the <laughs> electrons are hitting the, the target material. And we keep the target material at an angle, slant. Slant is very important. We keep at slant. We reduce the pressure up to 0 0.01 atmospheric. So we reduce the pressure uh, to one hundredth of atmospheric or maybe 1,000. So 0 0.001. Okay. Very small. So we make it really small pressure. Almost vacuum for the obvious reason. And then these electrons are accelerated. And now after acceleration, <coughs> before, <coughs> so when they arrive at uh, the target, they will have tremendous energy. What is the energy? So energy of this fast moving electron is how much? Minus V. So kinetic energy of uh, colliding electron with metal target is how much? Minus V electron volts. Just EV. Okay. E is the charge, V is the voltage, and we are going from minus to plus. No? You can see this is negative yeah. charge, this is positive charge. Yeah. So for electron, it is accelerating because the electron goes from low to high potential. <laughs> and kinetic energy is positive. So you cannot add minus, right? 
What that is? EV. EV is the energy of these electrons arriving at the target. And once they reach the target, what will happen? They will hit the target and will slow down. Now the question is, every metal will have lattice structure, isn't it? <laughs> and electrons are such a small particle that they will not hit just the first layer. They can penetrate up to few layer inside. Quite possibly they can go up to 10 layers of atom. Maybe more than that also. So no electron after hitting the surface will come to dead rest. That's impossible. What happens? Every electron will undergo many successive collision, not one collision. So before actually coming to rest, it may undergo infinite collision. Technically. Okay. Because every time you lose energy, you don't make, become zero energy. So every time you lose energy, you go and hit other atoms. Then you go and hit other atoms. Then you go and hit other atoms. Okay. So what is the possibility of losing all of the energy at once? Tell me. Having EV energy and colliding the target, what is the possibility of losing all of energy at once? <laughs> is it high probable event or very low probable event? What do you think? Low probability. It is very, very rare. It's like impossible. Event. No electron can lose all energy at one point. Because no collision is perfectly inelastic. You just lose energy and then you scatter inside the metal lattice. <laughs> so some energy, see, the fraction of EV, some fraction of EV will have more probability. Some fraction will have less probability. So you can say the entire EV, the probability of entire EV to be reduced to zero is how much? Zero. That probability itself is zero. So now what happens as a result of the energy loss called the kinetic energy loss, the loss appear as electromagnetic wave. Do you know this? <laughs> the kinetic, the loss of kinetic energy of these electrons actually appear as electromagnetic wave and this electromagnetic wave we call continuous excel. What do you call? So now there are two types of x rays which will come across. So <clears throat> what is the maximum possible energy that an electron can possibly lose? EV. EV. That's the critical value. So maximum possible energy of released photon in the due process of collision equals to EV. Can you say it like this? If maximum electron can lose is EV, so what is the maximum photon energy possible? EV. Mm -hmm. Now here V is here EV V is not the unit. V is the voltage. <laughs> the voltage which we don't know. V itself may be 100 volt, 1000 volt, like this. So V may be like this. Uh, it's very confusing, I know. Yeah, I know, it's confusing. So do you realize this? This V is the voltage? Yes. So V is called accelerating voltage. Okay, now someone was asking me that uh, why we need high potential difference. Do you get the answer? Thus, yes, sir. You got your answer. Why high voltage is required? Yeah, because we are talking about which ray? X-ray. So X-ray will have what energy range? In kilo electron volt, isn't it? Yes. So can we get kilo electron volt by hitting with electron volt energy or mill electron volt? Energy? No. No. That's logical. Right? I mean, why we need more? Because we are talking about X-rays, which is having a dimension which you know. <laughs> okay. Now, although this happened, you know, accidentally by the root again, but when Kulich performed, he performed as per you know the idea. Like he, he was having the fair idea that how to do it. 
and what happened before rundgen can possibly give a good name or better name in mathematics what happens when you don't know something what you call let it be x, x. so because rundgen was not knowing anything about this new radiation so he simply called x and before he could actually give a name the application came to being in healthcare possibly okay and rundgen take the took the photograph of the y finger and uh, in that x ray the ring is also there it's a very famous uh, x ray photograph you have seen in internet so <clears throat> that got so much famous that he got the nobel prize without I mean, before he could realize something he got you know the instant celebrity okay so that was the, the quickest uh, you can say becoming celebrity in the world of science the quickest he got he got recognition nobel prize and everything and he was still studying about x ray okay you just discovered something and then you are the wc round again anyway so if i write the energy let me write the energy of that photon either as i as per the formula of uh, planck's law we can write as h nu <coughs> so the frequency is this is the maximum frequency or minimum frequency maximum or the same thing we can also write as e equals to ev so we can write as hc by lambda, lambda max or min min so the minimum possible wavelength in x ray spot hc oh. by how much is oh i made a mistake no i was so it is hc by this minimum wavelength is called cut off wavelength cut off wavelength i'll come to that question so they will ask you find the formula for the cut off wavelength like what is the minimum possible we can produce theoretically okay so can we produce wavelength less than this no can we produce wavelength less than this yes or no yes or no 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 and can we produce wavelength more than this no no we cannot <laughs> so this is the <clears throat> the first part of x ray now there are two types of x ray the first is called <clears throat> continuous x ray and the b which is more important which we are going to study in detail is called the characteristic x ray <clears throat> what is continuous we will again come to this part so we have infinite electrons getting bombarded on the metal sample the target metal and because we have infinite electrons so all will re, i mean lose some energy but because of the statistical nature all will not lose the same energy at the same time isn't it so all will lose different amount of energy at first collision yes or no so there are so many electrons getting bombarding the the metal target <laughs> and all will lose some energy can we say all will lose same energy or all will lose different amount of energy different fraction of ev will be different amount so <clears throat> because they are losing different fraction of ev energy so the photon that we will get will be single photon or a continuous photon like a photon of varying wavelength and frequency what we are going to obtain yeah full photon spectrum varying yeah so we'll get a full spectrum the wavelength beginning from the cut off up to infinity isn't it theoretically yes what is infinity <coughs> the minimum energy like zero energy right so how much we lose maximum ev 
So the lowest frequency, uh, lowest wavelength we can get is HC by EV. So when you plot the graph <laughs> of uh, photon intensity of X-ray versus lambda, so we, what, what we are going to plot here, photon intensity. What is photon intensity? Like a particular wavelength, the count of particular wavelength per unit time, right? Intensity means what? How many count you're getting of one particular wavelength? It's just like, you know, cricket uh, uh, in a given over, how many sixes you're hitting, how many fours, how many singles and all. So if you pull out the graph of <laughs> the photon intensity versus lambda, always remember <laughs> that photon intensity is called probability graph. You have to think in terms of probability. What is the probability of the lambda minimum? Which means what is the chance that we can lose whole energy at once? Zero. It is zero. So graph will begin from where? Lambda zero. Lambda. But as lambda will increase, as lambda will increase, the chance will grow. Yes. Chance will grow. Chance will grow. And then at some lambda, the chance will be the probability will be maximum. Yes or no? So there will be some uh, wavelength or some uh, frequency <coughs> for which the count found is maximum. That is the property of nature. So if you plot a graph, I think I need to plot on the next page. Next page. This is not sufficient space. So I'll plot it here. <laughs> now try to understand this part very carefully because no book will explain you this graph. Exactly. I'm going to give you the exact description of graph it's a very complex graph but you can exactly understand why the graph is the way it is okay so it's written next page you can go to next page and then you can see here <laughs> so our graph will begin from cut off can we have graph left left of this point no can you go left of this Is it possible to have graph on the left of this point? Yes or no? No. So left of this means you have energy more than the EV, which is impossible. So every graph is going to be on the right of this. And if you plot the graph, the graph will grow very rapidly. Very soon it will reach the peak. But just at the beginning of the fall, some strange behavior was found, very strange. So we got some spike in the graph, which is not a regular graph. So blue is the regular graph. And then the red is a spike. You can see the intensity is zoomed. To a large value, and then continue the, then the blue graph will continue, and then again you see another spike, but this time the height of both the spike will <coughs> reduce. And then again, the blue gra graph will continue. We will get many spikes, but uh, the first two spikes are prominent. Other spikes are, you need to really zoom the graph to see. So we believe that this is now almost. So this is the typical x graph. The blue graph is actually representing something called 
continuous action. And this continue the reason of production of continuous action is the the loss in kinetic energy by the bombarded electrons. So, what is the reason of a constant uh, continuous action? Reason. What is the spelling of reason? R E A. Reason. The spelling is spelling. R E A S O N. R E A S O N. Ah, correct. Reason. Sometimes it happens. <laughs> So reason for continuous excellent. What is the reason? Oh. There is there. Mr. Newton, are you there? <laughs> so there will tell me something called the German language and talk to you in a while. So the reason for continuous excellent is loss of kinetic energy of bombarding <coughs> electron by metal target. And because this is the continuous loss of energy, because when you undergo collision, <coughs> You lose kinetic energy. So loss in kinetic energy appears as X-ray photon of wavelength varying <laughs> between lambda mino. You can say cut off wavelength. <coughs> wavelength to infinite. And this is theoretical. Now, because you slow down as a result of a collision, and the slowing down, the loss of energy is appearing as photon. So this is called breaking radiation. So continuous X-ray is also called continuous continuous X-ray is also called breaking radiation. radiation and the word breaking radiation I think breaking is not happening it's like breaking radiation and this breaking radiation in German is called oh there will take. How to say breaking German? <laughs> I don't know what it is called, but the. Sir, I am not sure, but it's Bremsen or Bremen. Correct. It's called Brems. Oh, I'll, I'll tell you the exact thing. Because see, this German word is very confusing for me. So I thought of asking the expert, but anyway, expert is also some, seems to be confused. Yeah, I got it. B R E M S S T R A H. U is not there. Very close. Oh my God. Oh, come on. Rest is correct. So now I'm going to enter the German language. This is called Bremster lung radiation. Okay, which means breaking radiation. <laughs> the word is logical. Okay. Why it is logical? <laughs> because breaking means slowing down. 
So this continuous X-ray is as a result of the slowing down of electron by the target metal. And that's why this is called the Bremster lung radiation. The next part is very interesting. The next part, the spike, I mean, if you try to figure out what is the spike region? Yeah, so now comes something really interesting. Reason for characteristic X-ray. Reason for characteristic X-ray. You all guys are okay if I continue for next half an hour? Yes, sir. Yes. Manasri, you are okay? Yes, sir. Okay. So reason for characteristic X-ray. This is interesting. So in any metal target, <coughs> we have to go back to the, the electronic configuration. So metal is multi-electron system or single electron system? <coughs> multi-electron. Multi-electron system. So can we apply the Bohr's theory? No. 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 We cannot apply. But we will anyway apply using some modified Bohr's theory. So now we have this multi electron system. So in the first orbit, we will have how many electrons, guys? Two. The next we'll have eight. 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 The next <coughs> two, eight, 18. 18. 18. I mean, you can do this configuration and so on. Because we are talking about the atomic number more than 25 to 30 and more. So we have at least three, four orbit of electron, isn't it? <laughs> so first and two, first we will give you 10 electrons. So it's up to the atomic number 10. So at least we are entering into the third orbit for sure, isn't it? But we can go to fourth, fourth, fourth also, fifth also, and so on. Okay. <clears throat> now what is happening? Why this this was the you know puzzle was. The graph is suddenly giving you a spike. So that spike means that particular wavelength is zooming up. I mean, you're getting in large, large number that particular photon because the probability has shoot up. You can see the height is representing what? Probability. And there is a shoot up in the probability. So the continuous graph is a smooth graph, but this graph, the spike is representing a different kind of X-ray, which we'll talk about just in a while, called characteristic X-ray. And why we call characteristic, we also come to why we call characteristic, because the brimster lung or how you say the how to pronounce this? This one. Bremstralum. Bremstralum. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to read the paper. Bremstralum. The DLC has to read the paper. Okay, whatever you want. Anyway. So the reason for characteristic X-ray is something to do. In the due process of collision of bombarded electron with the target metal, it is not just the crystal which is slowing down the electron. Sometimes some electron was able to knock out. And that's the biggest thing. That is the biggest theory for today. That bombarded electron is sometimes able to knock out the electron within the atom, not from outside. It is not reducing or uh, slowing down through the collision process of atom. No. 
<coughs> these fast moving electrons coming from the cathode plate they are entering the atom actually and in the due process they are knocking out some electron now the biggest question so the bombarded electron is entering this <laughs> atom and knocking out this guy so as a result one is coming and two electrons are leaving the one who is coming and the other which you are knocking out this is called the knock out film knock out sir can it not replace the bombard the electron which is called inertia beta inertia inertia is not will let you stop okay stay there <laughs> now these are random process so we only talk about those atom in which this has happened not where they have stayed because if they have stayed we cannot say anything right yeah no neutral because nothing is going to happen it is the same situation okay so this in knockout phenomena suddenly you disturb the entire electronic configuration isn't it you create some empty space you create a hole so if i draw the the energy diagram of orbit like k l m n o p and so on i think alphabet is correct k l m n o p yeah this is <laughs> long time i studied this in uh, in the garden so which i don't remember now. so anyway if it is correct i can proceed so k l m n o p <laughs> Have you ever wondered why it is not for A B C D? Yes, but कभी आंसर. Hmm. I think K represents kernel actually. So. Kernel. Pardon? If K represents kernel, hmm. so what are other name known like? Nothing. You start. That's the starting point. Even I don't know. Okay. I am guessing it. If you know someone, let me know. So I will ask the the grand grandchildren of board why you named it K, why not A B C D. I mean, there is some reason. I don't know. Some reason must be there. <laughs> so maybe in German, okay, Garav can tell. German K is more prominent. Oh, sir. Okay. okay. Maybe. Anyway. So every atom will have <laughs> electronic configuration, and that configuration will lead to the lowest energy configuration or highest energy configuration. How they distribute? What is the rule of energy? I mean, uh, electronic and configuration to obtain the lowest. Lowest. Correct. To obtain the lowest energy configuration. So our goal is clear. We want the lowest energy configuration, isn't it? Now tell me, yeah. as per the theory of probability, which electron is most likely to be knocked out? K, L, or outer cell? The inner cell or the outer cell? Outer. Anybody else want to say something? Which shell electron is most likely to be knocked out? The innermost or the outermost or something in between? Neither innermost nor outermost. The between one. Outer. 
how many think it is outer, not the middle one, not the inner most. Raise those who think it's outer. Let me see the proponent of outer. Sir, one less than outer most actually. One less than outer should have the most electron. Path once you say outermost, just what's your opinion? So, who all are the proponent of outermost <laughs> or second outermost? <laughs> Innermost. Many are not uh, participating in this poll. Okay. <clears throat> so for your surprise, the most probable event is the innermost. Now, given this answer, can you explain why? <laughs> Let's say I have given you the answer. This is the answer. The innermost will have the most likely to be knocked out. This event is most likely. <laughs> Only because there are two electrons. But if you have more electrons, then there is more chance, no? Yeah, that, that's why I also said out. Mm. So here comes the theory. Eisenberg uncertainty principle. You know what is this principle? Yes, sir. So yeah. the innermost is most confined electron. Do you realize this? Yeah. Yes. As you go away, though the electron is increasing, but the you can see the region, the space is increasing more drastically. Okay. So overall, the probability of finding an electron will reduce actually. So the event which is most probable is which one? The innermost because they are the most confined at one, so the charge that they will be hit is much more. <coughs> Do you realize this? Yes, but so so imagine the there, is, the there, there, is the there is a palace. There is a palace. Imagine there is a palace, and there are two the doorman or whatever you can say, the security guard who are standing near the door, okay, and then there are four person who is roaming around the building. Imagine the area they are covering near the door and entire building. Although the number is more, but the probability of fitting is less. Do you realize this? The uncertainty because, because they are in constant motion, the chance that they will be hit is maximum. Which one? The Target which is least moving, or you can say in the smallest possible space. And these are random phenomena. So in random phenomena, we have to talk about the randomness and the probability actually. <clears throat> so will you agree that the innermost will have the maximum probability? Yes. Yes. Because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. The innermost electrons are most likely to be knocked out. Okay. If this is clear, then I can proceed. Yes. The number of it electrons is... won't uh, uh, compensate for the increase in volume in nuclear confines. Yeah, it's exactly like this. It is not about area, it's about volume. So volume will grow much more, you can say exponentially than the number of electrons. The number actually. Okay. So eventually it will die out. Okay. 
So as you go away, the chance will be lesser only. And we are riding on the uncertainty principle. So the innermost it can get the maximum chance of getting knocked out. And that is experimentally verifiable because this peak, the biggest peak is corresponding to the, the biggest possibility. And in this case, the K shell electron is knocked out. The green one is representing the L shell electron is getting knocked out. And then we can have K, L, M shell, but that will be like this. And, and therefore we are ignoring it. Then this will be going on. And on. The spike will decay exponentially. The first two is only significant. And we never talk about the <coughs> third, fourth, and all. So the first two shell will have a major contribution in the spike. These spikes are corresponding to the phenomenon of knocking out of electrons. So which electron has, has been knocked out? Which is most likely to be knocked out? Tell me. The K shell. K shell. In the K shell, we have one hole and one electron is there. And in the L shell, we have eight electrons, right? Yes. Yeah. And then we have so many other electrons. So <clears throat> we have electrons, then when the many, and let's say we have many electrons everywhere. Once an atom will have this empty space, like a hole, it will undergo a new configuration in order to further minimize the energy. Because the low quantum number cannot be empty. That is violation of Holmes rule, isn't it? Yeah. So low quantum, you see, quantum number will get filled from low to high, not from high to low, isn't it? Yeah. So this new quantum state, which is having empty and there is no electron, will get filled almost in no time. <laughs> now the question is, who will fill? So anyone can fill because again, it's a theory of probability. Anyone can fill. Anyone can fill. Electron from L can fill, from M can fill, from N can fill, O can fill, P can fill, if it is available at all. But again, <coughs> going back to the theory of probability, which event is most likely? So this empty space will be filled by which electron? The likelihood. The likelihood to be filled by the electron to the clear shell, which is going to happen in most probable case. The electron from L, M, N, O, P, Q, which one? Tell me. Out outermost shell? Because it will correspond to maximum energy release. Imagine if there is some happening as some accident in the neighbor's place, who will come first? From the Pufa from the other city or the nearby neighbor? Nearby. Yeah. That's common sense because it will follow the common sense rule. So the event which is most probable is which one? The nearest neighbor will fill first. That is the likelihood. Okay. All can come. All are welcome. So hearing the news, the Fufa, Chacha, Tao, all will come. But which is most probable event? Um, the neighbor coming to you for rescue, isn't it? Yeah. Do you realize this? This is very simple. Logically. So the event which is most probable is the, com <laughs> the coming of electron from the K shell. So this transition is called the most probable transition. And when the electron will come from the nearest orbit, this photon, because there is a transition, a photon will be released. And now we have to learn something called nomenclature. So this photon is releasing by virtue of transition two to one, isn't it? So this is called lambda k photon. Like the wavelength we can have we represent. The, what is the nomenclature? Lambda k y k because you are going to which shell? K shell. <laughs> so this is called lambda k. <clears throat> now who is coming? Your neighbor. So neighbor is the nearest person. Correct? So for the nearest person, the probability we write as alpha. Imagine, as you said, this guy is coming. 
So this is called lambda. Now this is also photon. And this we call as lambda. You're going to which which cell? Okay. Mm. But you're coming from the next to next neighbor. Beta. Beta. Imagine if this is happening from here. So this will release another photon, lambda, k. Next is alpha, beta, gamma. <coughs> gamma. Then next is delta also and so on. Do you realize what I'm saying? Yes. Sir. So this nomenclature is clear. <laughs> okay, which one will have more energy, gamma, beta, or alpha? Energy wise, which is maximum in these three cases? What is the energy relation? Gamma. The gamma. larger the transition, more the energy will be released. Correct. So the gamma, lambda ke gamma is having maximum energy. So if I talk about the wavelength relation, which is bigger wavelength? Alpha. Do you realize this? <laughs> the Wavelength relation? Yes. How many of you? Everyone. Everyone realizes this relation? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, sir. Energy wise, alpha is least, beta is more, gamma is maximum in this three cases. But event wise, which is most probable? Alpha. Alpha is most probable, then beta, then gamma, yes or no? Yes. And now we are at the right position. These two spikes are representing the two particular <coughs> wavelength So which event is maximum, like uh, most probable? The two to one transition or three to one transition? Two to one. Two to one is most probable. So this and wavelength is more for which? Alpha or beta? Alpha. So the, the line before is lambda k beta. The line next is the lambda k. Do you realize this? Energy wise. <laughs> Energy wise, is smaller wavelength is more energy, so beta will come before alpha, isn't it? <laughs> and then the event wise, lambda k alpha is more probable event. So which event is more? The k alpha photon is more in probability. You can see the height. Do you see the height? Yes. What is height representing? The probability. So <clears throat> K alpha is having highest protein, then K beta, yes or no? Gamma I'm not representing, I'm just representing two spy. In the green graph, what is happening? <laughs> In the green graph, you know what is happening? The electron which is getting knocked out is from where? Which shell? L shell. The symbol will be lambda L. Tell me which one is alpha, which one is beta? The right one is alpha, beta. Right one is alpha. alpha. And the next one is beta. Beta. For the same reason, first of all, among K and L, K is most probable, L is less probable because as you go away from the nuclei, the uncertainty in position will grow. So the knocking out event will slow down, decrease. <laughs> and then comes the energy transition. So the nearest neighbor will have more protein. So the K alpha, L alpha line will be bigger than L beta. And consequently, we will have two spike graph with the first spike less, second spike bigger. 
and now you can exactly decode the graph. Do you realize the graph entirely? Yes. So do you realize the meaning of characteristic X-ray and continuous X-ray? <laughs> Yes or no? Yes. Now, every metal target which we will use in the experiment <coughs> will have different configuration of electron, yes or no? Yes. Yeah. Because every metal will have mm. different configuration. And every configuration gives you physical property or every configuration gives you the energy relation. So, lambda k alpha of every metal sample will be same or different <laughs> lambda k alpha will vary from sample to sample yes or no yes, yes. lambda k beta will vary from sample to sample yes or no yes sir. and because it is varying from sample to sample so can we say these are the characteristic of the metal used yes that is why we call it characteristic because it will give you the character of the configuration. So the metal. And this should. Is clear? Yes. <coughs> it is clear, yes or no? So the characteristic Excel is clear to all of you. The graph is clear. The event is clear. Yes or no? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Before we wrap up today's session, I'll finish with the most lazy question. The guy who got killed in the World War II. <laughs> so, in this chapter, what you need to learn first? You need to learn the, how to relate the the lambdas k l n three is more than sufficient and then you can draw uh, like this like this no, this is better So this transition will give you the photon where lambda k alpha. How to write k? K means where you land. So the orbit in which you land is called the name lambda of that orbit. So k represents the, the orbit from which the <coughs> electron got knocked out. Okay. What about the next part? This is called the photon from here will be Lambda k beta. beta. This photon is called lambda k gamma. So yes. ek minus which is more energy in value. So el you can say el minus ek. Sc by lambda k alpha. EM minus EK. SC by lambda K beta. Generally, we go up to two value, but you can go to EN minus EK. SC by lambda K gamma. I hope this is clear. Yes or no? Yes. Yes, sir. Now imagine the knocking out of electron is happening in the L share. So who will come? M to N or K to L? Which event is most probable? Yes, K to L. It will never happen. No configuration will increase the energy. Understood. So yes, from sir. low energy orbit, known will go to the high energy orbit. Understood. Yes. So that is already the lower energy configuration. You reconfigure to minimize energy, not to maximize energy. Understood. 
It is like you will take one electron from here, then who will fill this gap? Yeah. <coughs> so the motion will be always from the high to low only. It is never from low to high. Clear? First of all, this doubt is clear. So the yes. moment the moment we have the empty space or the the knockout event in the the L shell, the transition will be M to L. And so on. Um, so here the energy we can write as E M minus E L. How much? S C by. <laughs> what do you can write here? Tell me. Lambda L. Lambda L alpha. L alpha. So SC by lambda L alpha. Hmm? EN minus EL, how much? Although no one will ask you this. The very famous question that uh, you will come across. <laughs> Is relation of lambda k alpha, lambda k beta, and lambda l alpha. What is the relation between this? Very famous question. Tell me. So, how to proceed to solve question like this? You can write the energy relation, first of all, for k alpha. <laughs> So what is E lambda k alpha? <coughs> e L minus E k S C by what is lambda k beta? <coughs> no, what I wrote. And what is L alpha? <laughs> now, can you manipulate to relate? So, if I say equation one, equation two, equation three, so two minus one implies what? <laughs> and <clears throat> let's call four. So from three and four. So you just need to relate all these things this way. So from three and four we can add. There lambda and alpha. Yeah. This is not there. Oh, LHS. Uh, this is good. Yeah, LHS. Yeah, yeah. I made a mistake here. This is just more. Right. Lambda L alpha. Correct? Uh, yes. So one by lambda L alpha plus one by lambda K alpha is one by lambda K beta. So this is a famous relation that you will come across in various examination and SU one of course. This is clear? Yes, sir. So the first kind of question that you will come across is the relation uh, uh, relating these terms like K alpha, K beta, L alpha. So some sort of relation will come across. Next one, the most less. The most less. Okay. Uh, 
And this was the defining moment in the history of science where the Mendeleev periodic table got replaced by modern, modern periodic modern. table, right? The Mosley's, which is based on this law. <laughs> so we know the formula from the Rydberg formula. Right? So remember the Rydberg formula, remember the Rydberg formula or relation. What was that? One by lambda plus two? R is Z square. I hope you remember this formula. Yes or no? Yeah. No, this was for the single electron system. <laughs> but <clears throat> for a many electron system, We talk about something called the screening effect or shielding effect. What is screening effect? <coughs> so you can think electron as the, the cloud model. So the nucleus will have the charge Z E. So the electron. <coughs> In the first orbit, we have two electrons. And if I ask you, can you find the force on this electron? So what will be the force in this electron? So long time back, I, I told you something really important that the actual formula <coughs> for the force is not Coulomb's law. What is that? You know, Q into E. Yeah. You might must not have realized this when I said. But today you have to realize. So if you want to find the force on one electron, then remove from the system. Try to find the electric field at the point P near this point. How to find the electric field at that point? So we have to use a Gauss law <laughs> because Gauss law gives the resultant electric field at the point P, isn't it? Yes. Just so this is, this charge is ready, but the electron charge is also is spread out on a spherical, you can say layer. So for the next electron, <clears throat> this is like a, a negatively charged sphere of net charge minus okay. So if I try to draw the Gaussian surface, just above this cloud, So as per the Gauss law, you can say E into four pi R square. The flux equals to how much? U enclosed. What is Q enclosed? Z minus one into E, isn't it? Ah, uh, yes. By absolute not? So basically the nuclear force is no longer what we thought earlier. Okay. So the entire, you know, the derivation, if you start the Bohr's theory from the scratch, this will <clears throat> happen that uh, the, okay, this is a very simplistic model. The effective nuclear charge, what do you call this? Effective nuclear charge because why we are writing this effective nuclear charge because to understand the Bohr's law in the context of the system we write the ability for only one electron so what will the what will be the contribution of the remaining electron so they kind of screen the effect of nuclei and so the actual force that you will experience is not the force 
due to the entire nucleus, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Just you can go. So the ABD, which you draw for the many electron system, will only talk about the effective nuclear charge, not the nuclear charge. Do you realize this? And the effective nuclear charge is not something as simple as I have shown. Of course, for the K shell, we, this is always true. Up to first layer, this is true. Because the K shell will have the shielding effect of 100%. But as you go away from the nuclei, you will not contribute you know, in the shielding process 100%. The shielding will change. And therefore, the effective nuclear charge, we don't write Z minus 1 or 2 or 3 or 4. We write Z minus V in general. Okay. So for charge, we write Z as Z effective. Because anyway, we have to multiply with E to get the effective nuclear charge. So effective nuclear charge, you can say Q effective. Uh, or maybe I can say capital Q effective. effective nuclear charge okay so <clears throat> this will be Z effective into E. And this is the Z effective formula. And B depends on the electron configuration. So if you have studied the physical chemistry, you might have come across this uh, calculation of B. Okay. So for every orbital, there is a different uh, shielding coefficient. Okay. So as you go, I mean, for the S subcell, it is maximum, then the P will have lesser shielding effect. Uh, D will have even worse and F will have the worst possible shielding effect. And that is why in the F group element, we see something called lanthanide contraction. So the yes. idea of lanthanide contraction is due to this poor shielding effect. Okay. <clears throat> so growing the electron in the F subcell will not shield, rather it will increase the attraction. And therefore, the shell will contract you will come closer to the nuclei. And so the size will decrease. So with the increase of electron in the outermost, the F subcell, the size of the atom will reduce. Why? Because the shielding is negligible. So with more and more electron, the Coulombic force will grow in value. Because the shielding effect is not contributing. <coughs> So instead of reducing, it is increasing the force. Do you realize this? And that's why yes. we have the lanthanide contraction. So in the lanthanide group, if you go from left to right, the size will decrease. And because lanthanides are shown different, I mean, outside the uh, periodic table, that's why the moment you cross that lanthanide LA part on the right hand side, the atomic size is very small. If you remember the periodic table. Is yeah. this making some sense to you what I'm saying? May not have. Yeah. So now the idea is we have to modify the Rydberg formula for the main electron system. Oh. Anti basis. Yeah. I cannot go further. So what I'll do is, okay, I'll continue this in the next class. Now you can start solving the, but without this, how you can solve it? Okay, anyway, you have both three to finish first. Okay. So start solving the Bohr's theory and try to finish as much as possible. The last 10, 20 question, the last 10 question of s is superb. And it is not only part of the Bohr's theory, it is from the magnetism, Bohr's theory, uh, maybe EMI and something like this. So those questions I will solve uh, once you come as a doubt, I'll bring as a doubt. Okay, so mostly a question I'll continue in the next lecture. All right, guys. Good night. It's too much later. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Out. Hmm. Uh, in the 